Halleluja. Bless the Lord. Thank you, choir and band. It's a good thing to praise the Lord. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 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 Well, family, we are delighted to have you at Solid Rock this morning. Thank you for making this a part of your Sabbath uh, experience. And we pray that God is meeting you and touching you and drawing you unto himself. Over a year ago, family, I preached a message entitled Freedom. It was a series of talks that I did on freedom. One of the messages that I spoke about was freedom from sexual bonds. I don't know if any of you recall that message. But a part of my preparation allowed me to come across an author that, that really touched and spoke to my life through the book that she had authored, The Invisible Bond, Breaking the Invisible Past, rather. The Invisible Bond, How to Break Free from Your Sexual Past. In reading that book, and then sharing with our congregation, I made the determination that I wanted to invite that author, Barbara Wilson, to come and speak to our congregation. This contact took place over a year ago, and through the process of time and, and through the sovereignty of God, he has ordered the steps of Barbara Wilson to be here with us this Sunday morning. Family, I want you to know that, that God will speak to your heart today through our speaker. You will hear her testimony. You will hear the impact and the journey that God led her through to bring her to this place where he is ministering God's grace to many people. She's an international radio speaker and a television speaker and speaks to youth and adults all over the world on the, the power of sexual bonding and healing. I can tell you that we are living in a generation that is sexually dysfunctional. We're living in a time where the full effects of the sexual revolution has caused tremendous pain and harm to people's lives. But God has a plan to heal us and to restore us. Can someone say amen? And today, beloved family, I want to ask you to welcome a fellow Canadian to this pulpit, Barbara Wilson, as she comes to share. Would you give her a great round of applause as she comes? Thank you, Barbara. God bless you there. Amen. On yet? Oh, good. I forgot to turn my thing on. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for your kind welcome. And as Pastor Jay was saying, we share some Canadian roots. Although I thought it would be fun to ask you, who do you think has the true Canadian accent? Really, now, do you think his is a true Canadian accent or is it mine? <laughs> well, well, yeah, well, the true Canadian, please stand up. Well, Actually, neither one of us have a true Canadian accent, do we, Pastor Jay? Because I've been in California now for the past 12 years. God moved us there 12 years ago with my family. And so now I kind of joke, I'm going, I really don't have a country. I'm kind of, I have no identity. I say A and ha. Huh. And so, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of lost a little bit. And I've lost some of my, you know, some of my accent. But I st you will still hear the occasional out and about. And I also say sorry. You know what sorry is? It's really sorry. You guys say sorry, right? We say sorry. So just in case, you know, if you need any translation, I can help with that later. But so I was raised Canadian, and I want to give you a little background about what that's like because it'll kind of put into place. I feel like there's a wind blowing up here. Do you hear it? It's, it's just me. me. Okay. We'll kind of put into place kind of what I'm doing and how did I ever get to this place. So Canadians, just so you don't know, if you, don't, if you aren't from Canada or you haven't met any Canadians, we're very reserved and we're, you know, we're, we're kind of private people. We're not big into hugging. Um, you know, we shake hands very politely. But, you know, like the personal space thing, you know, like there's a line. You know, you don't cross that line. And so then I moved to California. All of a sudden I have complete strangers hugging me and I'm going, what is the matter with these people? But now, you know, I've kind of, I've kind of gotten into that. But also, in, in addition to being Canadian, I was raised Baptist. Now, that's a whole different culture. You know, it was very legalistic kind of Baptist church, and so a lot of it was about appearances, you know, kind of, kind of putting on that great appearance that everything is good, and, you know, you're, 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 um, you know you've got the language down. And so a lot of, I remember growing up thinking that, um, a lot of how we determine somebody's spirituality or where they were with God was, you know, how they were on the outside. And so that's kind of how I grew up. And so we, you could kind of put on this facade a little bit 
pretending that everything was okay, but on the inside, things may not be so great. Your pastor invited me to come and speak, and the message that God has given me is, it is a passion, and I believe it's God's message to bring hope and healing to our sexually broken and wounded generation. And I want to share with you just some of the things that God has done in my life, and and, and I'm not really a preacher, this isn't going to be like your typical sermon, but God just loves me to come and be myself and be real, something that I really wasn't able to be my whole life, and it's so wonderful to be freed from that and to be able to be real with people. So how does this reserved private Canadian girl end up traveling all over the world talking about sex, something very private, and sharing my story? I can assure you, as a young girl, I didn't pray and ask God, you know, you know, and you think about what do you want to be when you grow up? It wasn't like, God, let me grow up and go around the world and talk about sex. You know, sometimes I still joke with God. I'm going, couldn't you have given me something like more socially acceptable for my Canadian roots like prayer or spiritual growth? But no, I have to go around and talk about sex and, and bring up people hate me everywhere because I'm bringing up things that they don't want to think about and, but then be able to offer God's amazing healing and his message of grace. And that's, what he's done in my life. And so, as a Canadian born and raised in a Christian home, my dad was a Baptist pastor. I spent a lot of time in church. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was seven years old, and I remember that moment. I still remember it when Jesus entered my life. And I remember falling in love with him at a very young age, wanting to serve him with my whole life. And even as a young person, I got involved in teaching Sunday school. I was musical, did some music. Um, was a leader in my youth group, and I wanted to serve God with my whole life. I even told God, I'll go to Africa for you. I mean, that is really sacrifice, right? Being able to, you know, give up everything. At least then, now everybody wants to go to Africa. I want to go to Africa. But but that was my my goal and my dream. And when I was about 17, I, I had an opportunity to go away to a Christian high school and college, and it was in the province of Saskatchewan. And it was far away from my home, and so it was a live-in school. And I really felt it was part of what God's plan was for me. You know, this is part of my path. I'm going to serve God with my life. And it was here at this place that my, pa- my, my path took a different turn. And I often tell young people, you know, when you make good decisions, it usually leads to another good decision. But when you make bad decisions, it kind of leads to more bad decisions. At any point in a bad decision or bad choice, You can interrupt it with a good choice, and that will take you on a different path. Well, here I was trying to make good choices and ended up making a choice that would change the direction of my entire life. I didn't know it then. I was young, foolish, thinking that my whole life was ahead and that nothing that I did today would impact tomorrow. And so I had a boyfriend there, really my first, you know, serious boyfriend, and I made a choice to have sex with my boyfriend at that school um, that, that really ended up changing the entire direction of my next life, of, um, of my, the next choices that I made in my life. It wasn't something that I really wanted to do. I had wanted to save sex for marriage, and so it wasn't a plan that I had. And so here I was making this choice, and that choice led to another choice, another destructive choice in my life. My parents were not pleased with this young man that I had fallen head over heels in love with, and I decided he was the one. And at some point... I'm sure God was talking to me about this is not a good choice, but somehow I was drowning God's voice out too. And so I did. I ran away and I married this young man at 18 years old. And I was going to go to college. I was going to serve God with my life. And all of a sudden, those plans were gone and I was off on a new path. Well, that marriage didn't last very long. We were young. And I eventually, two years later, ended up back home, pretty broken and wounded, feeling rejected, feeling like I had made the biggest mistake in my life. And so now, as I'm feeling pretty worthless inside, I'm out looking for love. I'm out, I, I'm out looking for that next Mr. Right. And I kept falling into the same mistakes over and over until eventually I heard these words, you're pregnant. I couldn't be pregnant. I was, now had started college. That's not possible. I, I, this cannot be happening to me. And at that time, I was really kind of far away from God because I was making my own choices at that point and not listening to his plan for my life. And so I made another choice, another bad choice, that again would um, cause more pain and destruction in my life. And that choice was to have an abortion. And now, in a sense, you know that saying, the bottom dropped out, and that's really where the bottom dropped out for me. How could this Christian girl who was going to serve 
God and live her life for God, who was on a path, I'd already actually begun speaking even as a teenager, and how could this girl end up here? At 21 years old, already married, been married, divorced, and now I'd had an abortion. So I went on to get married again. I'm married to my husband, Eric, of 31 years. We have four amazing children, two beautiful grand, uh, daughter-in-laws, three grandchildren, and a fourth one on the way. And God has been good and blessed us in many ways. And we were raising our children in the church, just like many of you. And I wanted my kids to make sure that they didn't make the same mistakes I did. And yet here I was in church afraid to let anyone know my story. You know, everybody looked so good. Nobody was talking about their stuff. I assumed that I must have been the only one who messed up. And so I couldn't be real. I couldn't be honest. I couldn't be who I really was. And even though I asked God to forgive me over and over again, I never felt forgiven. I still felt stuck spiritually, emotionally, even physically. I felt stuck in my relationships. And so for 25 years, even though... I kept asking God to forgive me, and I, and I kept thinking that must be the, the, the path here. And then I started feeling like a bad Christian because I thought I can't even do forgiveness right. Like, what is the matter with me? You know, and I'd do well for a little while, and then somebody would say something. They'd talk about, you know, how they did it all right, and then, I, then that shame would come back. Or I remember one time listening to people on the radio, this woman talking about her abortion, and I thought, so I, I listened, my ears perked up, and I'm going, wow, somebody else sharing about an abortion. And then she said, and then I became a Christian, and I've been just perfect ever since, basically what she said. And I'm going, oh, well, that's not my story. I guess, I guess, you know, I'm the only Christian who's done that. And I remember in this one instance when I was listening to that woman talk, God said to me, one day you're going to be on the radio sharing about your abortion, but from the perspective of having been a Christian. And I said, God, over my dead body, because I'm going to the grave with this story so for the next 25 years, I hid. I hid myself from myself. I hid from God. I hid from my friends. I couldn't be real even with my husband. I couldn't be real with my children. What if they asked me about my past? And I tried to live this outward appearance of the perfect Christian, just like I was taught, but feeling anything but perfect on the inside. It was pretty draining. It's very draining pretending all the time, isn't it? It's pretty draining not to be able to be real with anyone and live in that silent, secret shame that no one knows and no one would accept you if they ever knew. And so it negatively impacted all of my relationships with my friends and my husband and my children my God until God showed me something that changed my life forever. And he showed me that in addition to needing forgiveness, I also needed healing. You see, God had already forgiven me because I'd asked him many times. In fact, he'd given, forgiven me the first time I asked him. But without healing, I was still living out of those wounds and lies that my choices had impacted me with. And it was keeping me from being able to receive God's forgiveness, even feel it, be able to live and walk in that forgiveness and freedom. And so God took me on a healing journey. And that's when he moved me from Canada, our family from Canada to California. And... Um, I love it because California is kind of a desert. You know, we have to water our plants so they all turn brown and die. And in Hosea, God showed me this verse. It says, it's not on the screen, but it says, I am now going to allure her, which is another word for woo. I'm now going to woo her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. And that's what God did in those first few years when he brought me to California. And I was by myself uh, as my husband was out to work and my children were at school and I didn't know anyone. I had no friends. We had just started getting involved in a church. There was nowhere to serve, nowhere to volunteer. I'd gotten really good at keeping my life so busy that I didn't have to think or feel. And it was just me and God. And he started to speak tender, kind words to me and draw me back to himself. That verse goes on to say, therefore I will give her back her vineyards and will make her valley of Achor a door of hope. And valley of Achor means trouble or pain. And it was in this place that God took the very thing that was my greatest shame and pain and turned it into a door of hope, not only for me, but now for others as God takes me around to, bring healing, to talk about his healing and grace to others. So here I am by myself in my, in my house, like I said, and, 
and God started drawing me closer to him, and I had this longing to do, have intimacy with God. I'd been searching for that for 25 years, even though I was a Christian. I was trying to get back to that place where God and I were okay. You know what I mean? Where I felt okay when I came to God rather than feeling this you know, block with him. And the first thing he wanted me to do was look at my abortion. And I remember thinking, well, why are we going here? I've asked for forgiveness over and over. Aren't we done with this? And that's when God began to show me that even though he had forgiven me, I was still living out of a lot of the wounds that that had caused that I needed healing from. <clears throat> at the time, I was also teaching sexual abstinence. I was working for a faith-based Christ Christian pregnancy center, and I was running their sexual health education and going into schools and talking about saving sex for marriage with young people. And isn't God a great multitasker? multitasker? Often, he'll lead us into ministries that come out of our own pain, but... Not only are we serving others, but God is using it to bring healing and wholeness to our life, and that's what he did. As I was out teaching about the brain and sex, and I'm going to share a little bit about that with you today, God began to use what I was learning and what I was teaching to show me how my sexual past was impacting me today, how the bonds that I'd created in my past were impacting the emotional and physical intimacy in my own marriage, and how he wanted to heal me from that. So God began to take me on a, on a healing journey, first for my abortion and then for my sexual past. And I was, God was transforming my life. He was changing everything. Gone was the shame. Gone was the pain of my past. And even the memories, it, would, you know, like it takes some effort now to bring up those memories where before it was like they were right there on a second's notice, slamming me in the face with shame. You know, I still kind of thought it was just about me, you know, that I was still the only one who'd really messed up. But God had already begun taking me out speaking, and I would share a little bit about how God can break the bonds that we create in our past, whether from abuse or trauma or our own choices, and uh, enable us to bond in a future relationship. And, and I would be so surprised because people would start lining up and they'd say, I, I can relate. I have these bonds too. Can God break my bonds, and what should I do? And I remember being so amazed. Wow, there's a lot of hurting people. And I remember being so afraid to share my story because people would, would reject me. They wouldn't accept me. I remember even for my, my wedding day, my Baptist family, none of them came to my, my wedding, my second marriage, because they didn't want to endorse my divorce. And that was my experience with the church. And I kind of felt like, well, I can't be safe here. It's not a safe place. And I can't really share everything now. And that's really what sent me underground with my story. And so I thought that everyone would be like that. But when I began sharing my story... God began to show me that there is so many hurting people. They're broken and hurting. And once I began to be real about my story and who I was, I actually became a magnet for people. And people would line up and want to talk to me and because I, they knew I was safe and I could understand what they were going through. And so that led to writing. I didn't even know I had a book in me, but it's really God's book. Speaking and helping lead people through sexual healing. And I lead a whole ministry at our church. We've had hundreds of women and now we've just started men's groups taking men and women through sexual healing for their past and what I love about that is it's this full circle of redemption God taking what the enemy wanted to use to destroy my life and use it to be a message of hope taking that valley of acor and turning it into a door of hope I don't know what your story is this morning you might have a similar story to mine and you relate to some of it, or, or you might have a very different story. Maybe there's abuse or trauma in your past, or maybe there's current struggles that you're having. Or maybe you're squeaky clean, like my, my dear friend, and she's a woman's pastor at our church, and we always joke because she's squeaky clean, and, and I've got the tainted past, and God has allowed us to do ministry together to hurting people. But I don't know, so I don't know what your story is this morning, but what I do know is the sexual revolution has affected us all. We are a sexually broken and wounded generation in need of not only God's forgiveness, but his healing. Since the 1960s, when the, with the invention of the birth control pill, we've seen an increase in sexual promiscuity, people having sex with multiple partners. Over 95% of people survey show that they have, or say that they've had sex outside of marriage, and not necessarily before a first marriage, but even in between marriages, because with the divorce rate up 50%, there's a lot of people that have been married and are out single again, having sex with multiple partners. 50% of women will have at least one abortion in their life with 44 million abortions worldwide every year. One in three women and one in six men will suffer sexual abuse before they turn 18. 
Over 50% of women's, a woman's first sexual experience was forced or unwanted. Pornography, a $97 billion global market in revenue, and I believe one of the greatest evils our human race has ever experienced. It is what has taught us to objectify men, women, and children as sexual objects, and it has greatly warped and perverted the beautiful gift that God gave us of sex inside marriage. So even if nothing has happened in your past, we have all been impacted by pornography's view of sex, and we've brought that into our marriages. Sex trafficking has become the second highest crime profit in the world, second only to drug trafficking. With an estimated 27 million people in human slavery today, more than at, more than at any time in our history, with 80% of those of being women and children sold for sex. I, began to get in, I have begun to get involved in the sex trafficking area. I've been to Cambodia three times now, helping an organization that is there rescuing girls out of sex trafficking. I'm on the board of a local organization in Sacramento, and we help rescue girls in our area. And God has begun to allow me to use what he's taught in my life to bring healing to them. We are a sexually broken and wounded generation oppressed by the weight of our sin and other sin done to us, and we are in desperate need of God's healing touch. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. If my people. Sounds like us, doesn't it? I remember when I first started writing this message, my first book, God said, I want you to write it to the church. God wants to start with us. If we will allow God to heal us, then he can start to use us to help heal this broken generation. If there's 95% of people having sex outside of marriage, they're in the church. If 50% of women are having an abortion, they're in the church. If one in three women and one in six men have experienced sexual abuse, they're in the church. God wants to heal our church. There is a darkness and oppression over the church of Jesus Christ because of what the sexual revolution has done, not only in our culture, in our world, but in our lives, in our families. It's come into our homes, even when we've tried to keep it out. And God wants to set us free. As the church heals and comes out from this sexual brokenness and, and sin, then we will be unleashed from our shame and pain and be able to walk in freedom to offer hope to the world and that will make us a safe place for the world to come to find healing and to find wholeness and to find Jesus. Now, if God is bringing things to mind as I talk this morning, I know how you may be feeling right now. I absolutely know. For 25 years, I kept secrets and I didn't like it when people reminded me of my past and my secrets because it made me feel terrible. So I understand if you're feeling that way this morning, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all that's happened to you and all of the choices that you have made that have hurt you, and so is God. But I don't want you to be afraid of whatever God is bringing to mind today. I want you to know that he, in his purpose for you, is revealing things that he wants to heal in you and set you free from. And even if none of this is your story, it is the story of someone you love, someone you work with, maybe someone you live with, and definitely somebody you worship with. And you may be that person that God will use to bring grace and healing. Just like me, in fact, it was my squeaky clean friend, women's pastor at my church, was the one that God used instrumentally to bring healing into my life and restore me back to the church so God will use us even if our story isn't the same. Two of the verses that God really used in my life to bring healing was, first of all, Joel 2.25. It says, I will, will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts and the other locusts and the locust swarm. Sometimes we give an analogy of the locust being the enemy. The enemy comes in, he wants to steal and destroy and rob us of all that God has for us, all that God wants to do in our life, the purpose that he has for our life. And often he uses this sexual area in our life because it does impact every part of our life, spiritually, emotionally, physically. And 
God says, even just like the locusts come in and destroy everything, God says, I will pay you back for what the locusts have eaten. God promises to pay us back to restore what the enemy has tried to rob in our lives in this area. That's what he's done in my life. Secondly, he says, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Basically, the message is God loves you. He loves you just the way you are. We don't have to clean up to come to God. In fact, he knows your whole story even more than you do. We tend to bury things. We forget things. If we've had trauma especially, that can get buried deep where we don't even have memories. And that's where God can show you what your real story is, everything that's happened to you and how it's impacted you. He accepts you just as you are in your mess, in your struggle, in your humanness, and your weakness. And he weeps with you for all that's happened to you and the choices you've made. He just wants to heal you and set you free so that you can have the unobstructed intimacy with him that you long for and that he longs to have with you and so that he can take what the enemy meant to, to destroy your life and use it for good. But maybe you're like me. Maybe you were a Christian. And you're wondering, does God, when you made your choices, and does God feel the same way about me? And yes, he does. I remember shortly after we, we joined our church in California, I was invited to join the board of the church. And we'd gone away for a retreat. And I was sitting, having a quiet time in the morning. And... Um, this thought came to me as I'm reading my, my Bible, and it's, the thought was, you know, if these people knew what you've done in your past, they would have never invited you on this board. I mean, like, who do you think you are? You don't belong here. And I remember sitting there honestly thinking that that's exactly how God saw me, that that was God. See how we can sometimes confuse the lies with the truth. And immediately, as I was thinking that, God said, reminded me of Ephesians in 5, it talks about how God really sees us as holy, unblemished, without wrinkle or stain. And God said to me, you may see yourselves, yourself as dirty and stained, um, unworthy, you know, that I can't use you, but I don't see you that way. Because of what Christ has done in your life, you accepted Christ, now I see you through Christ. I see you as holy, righteous, those are, um, that's amazing, isn't it? That's so amazing. That is the message of the gospel. And how was it that sitting in church all those years, I didn't get that message. I thought it was for everyone else, or I thought it was for that non-Christian coming in, and their whole past could be redeemed, but somehow mine couldn't. Somehow, because I was a Christian, I should have known better. That was a little prideful of me, somehow, that I might be better because I knew better. And so because I must have known better... I was more culpable for my sin and God wouldn't offer the same grace to me. What a lie that I lived under. What a yoke of shame I lived under for 25 years trying to find my way back to God. I want to share with you just briefly this morning some of the things that God has taught me about bonding that will um, be really amazing for you as it was for me and God, it's what God used to really totally transform my life. In this verse, Mark 10, 7, it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. Now, the Bible talks about this two becoming one, and it kind of blows our mind because it's really a, an incredible mystery. How does God take two people and make them into one? And I want to give you my little construction heart demonstration. It's very cheesy, but it really works. Um, so here we have a husband and wife, and God says... When they come together into marriage, I make them one. And so this oneness is, a, there's a physical oneness, an emotional oneness, a mental oneness, a spiritual oneness, and even a chemical oneness that we're going to talk about this morning. This mystery that God could take two people and make them one. Amazing. One in all of those ways. Now, as I was looking at this verse, I thought, well, is it just the marriage relationship that creates that oneness? Is it just walking down the aisle and saying, I do, starting that family, starting that union? Is that what creates that oneness? And then I found this verse. It was a little disturbing for me. 1 Corinthians 6.16 says, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. 
Now, when I read that, I probably read it many times, and all of a sudden, God just jumped it off the page to me, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, it says the two will become one flesh. That's the same as that last verse that's talking about marriage. And it comes from the same original language. So we know it means the same thing. Is it possible, God, that whenever we're having sex with somebody, whether or not we're married in the eyes of the you know, law, that we are becoming one flesh, that you are creating that same one flesh bondness in that relationship as you did in marriage? And that's what I believe God was showing me and teaching us, is that there's something about this sexual union that is so holy, so divine, that he creates a one flesh bond through the sexual union. And no wonder the enemy tries to destroy this area of our life. And no wonder he tries to, to help make us minimize it or, or make it not a big deal. Oh, God will forgive me if I do that. But guess what? Yes, God will forgive us. But we've created a one flesh bond with that person. And all of those bonds that we create, eventually we get married and we think marriage is this big giant eraser and it kind of wipes all the past away, but guess what? We bring those past bonds with us into that marriage. And so here we are in our very promiscuous culture, and the world says, it's not a big deal. It's just a physical thing. You can have sex and then move on. You know, you're not, you're not staying bonded to that person, but God says it is a big deal. I have made you one with that person. You are creating a bond that I have created to last your whole life. And when I began to learn this stuff, I'm telling you, I was a little disturbed. Are you feeling a little disturbed? I was going, oh my goodness, I am in big trouble. I'm one with a lot of people. And then I began to learn about the brain. <clears throat> and this was so amazing because it really validated, you know, God's design for us, his plan, and why he say, said to save sex for marriage. You know, often we tell our kids don't have sex for marriage, and that was... You know, when I was growing up, nobody was talking about sex. Nobody helped us prepare to save sex for marriage. And so I knew that God said, don't have sex, but I didn't know why, and I didn't know how to make that a reality. And so <clears throat> when I began to learn about the brain, it all made sense. It was like finally we were catching up to what God had been saying all along, that he's not trying to spoil our fun or make life hard for us. He's trying to protect us from creating these kind of one flesh bonds with people that will then impact our ability to have the kind of bond he wants for us to have inside marriage. So what I learned about the brain, your brain is an organ, and your brain releases, produces and releases chemicals and hormones. And when we experience sexual arousal and release, we also release chemicals and hormones, and they do a variety of things. We don't have time to get into all of that today. Um, I share more of that in my books, but I want to talk about oxytocin. It is the bonding hormone, the hormone scientists call the love hormone. Oxytocin is God's amazing design to bond us in relationships. It's released three times in large quantities in a human. When a, a woman gives birth, when she breastfeeds her baby, and it's released in men and women when they experience sexual arousal and release. And it was God, it is God's design to create bonds between human relationships, bonding mothers to their children so they'll still take care of them when they're teenagers and roll their eyes and slam the door on their way out. And it's, and, it's, and it's bonding husbands and wives together so that they will have the greatest chance of having a lifetime marriage. So that when difficulties come and they don't feel those love feelings every day, they're bonded together and that love deepens and gets stronger and makes them feel more and more attached. That was God's plan for us. That's what he wants us to have. You know, it's not about what God doesn't want us to do or have. It's about what, it's about what he wants to provide for us. And that's why he said, save sex for marriage because I know you, I created you, and this is really going to hurt if you take it outside of my plan. So what happens in our culture when we have had a lot of sexual partners? The thing is what science is beginning to show is that every time we have sex and break up and move on to a new relationship, we're actually starting to impair our ability to release oxytocin we actually start to have less oxytocin produced and released in our brains in the next relationship. And there's a lot of physiological reasons for that. But let me just say that when we've been hurt, we are, our, we are in emotional pain. And when we're in emotional pain, we can start to impair our ability to produce and release oxytocin. So you're in a relationship, you break up, you move on to a new one, you're actually going to initiate sex even sooner in the next relationship. And then, but the chance of you bonding 
and that relationship is less because you're not releasing as much oxytocin. And so now this cycle just continues, and that's what's happened. That's what happened to me, and I know that's what's happened to some of you. That cycle of broken relationships. And then eventually you can get to the place where you're not able to release oxytocin. Because you see, oxytocin, God designed oxytocin to increase trust in a relationship, reduce fear, and reduce anxiety. But if you're not releasing as much of that, then in the next relationship you'll have less trust, more anxiety, and more fear, and so you bond less, and over and over it goes. So do you think that's what God was trying to protect us from? That's what he wants to protect us from, inhibiting even our ability to bond the way he wants us to, which is why I think we have such a high divorce rate. It's what, I think it's why we struggle in our marriages and feeling emotionally and physically close, because we've, we've brought all of these past partners with us. I want to demonstrate that with my, with my hearts. and I started with two you know, individual hearts, but this relationship didn't last, and so now I'm tearing apart one heart. And the invisible bond of sex is like the invisible bond of glue. You can't see the glue, but you can see the impact of the glue. And this is what can happen with our sexual relationships and the bonding. Even though these two hearts now are going to go off and they're going to likely initiate new relationships, but they don't go off a whole person. They leave part of themselves behind with that person and they take a part of that person with them they are one with that person. And even though they move on, like the culture says, not a big deal. Just move on to someone new. But guess what? God says it is a big deal. You're one with that person. And now you're taking part of that person with you into the next relationship. Kind of sobering, isn't it? I remember when I heard that, I thought, well, I must be completely oxytocin deprived. There is probably not an ounce left no wonder I'm struggling in my marriage, feeling close and bonded to my husband. Do you think God can restore, pay us back oxytocin? Do you think he can do that? Do you think if God created our brains to release oxytocin, that if it's been robbed from us, as in maybe abuse or someone robbing our sexuality from us, or we made those choices, do you think God can pay us back and restore oxytocin? Absolutely. I don't think I would want to stand up here and tell you and talk to you at all not to offer hope at the end, right? And if you're feeling a little oxytocin deprived like I was, I have hope for you. God is in the healing and restoration business. He's in the business of paying us back for what the enemy has tried to rob us from, whether it's from someone else's choice against us or our own choices. God says, I can heal that. And yes, with healing, God can restore oxytocin. We get to watch that with women and men who go through healing and as God breaks the bonds that they've created in their past, we see the healing happening as the wounds you know, are healed. They're no longer in emotional pain and without the emotional pain, their brain is actually able to produce and release oxytocin again. Isn't our God a faithful, full circle, redemptive God? And I want you to know that there is nothing that God can't heal. You know, the enemy likes us to minimize things. Like you might be sitting there thinking, my thing is so little, it's not a big deal. I should just get over it. You know, I don't need to tell anyone. I just, just between God and me. You know, the enemy likes us to minimize things, but regardless of how small it may seem to you, it could still have the same emotional impact and still be causing you pain. God knows. Or maybe you're sitting there thinking, my stuff is so big, God can't heal this. God can't even forgive this. And I want you to know it doesn't matter how big or how small or how bad God can heal and restore anything. I've been talking a lot about healing, and that was one of the, the big things that God showed me was the difference between forgiveness and healing. Don't we just need forgiveness? That's what they kept telling me in church. I just needed to stop thinking about that and move on. Well, I couldn't even seem to do that right. You know, if you've had abuse or trauma, we would all agree we need healing for that. You know, we bring that into our marriages and we need healing. But what about our own choices? And this is where God really started to do a U-turn for me and began to show me that we also needed to heal from our past relationships. If I've created a one-flesh bond with other people and I've brought that into my marriage, I need to break that bond. I need healing. And I understood that from this verse here. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. 
All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins or is, uh, who sins sexually or is sinned against, my paraphrase there, sins against his own body. Now, God is saying the other sins we commit are kind of outside the body. What is it different about sexual sin? Well, remember I talked about how the bond is not just physical, but spiritual, emotional, mental, chemical. And it's like it impacts every part of us. We like to compartmentalize sex, and we think, well, God doesn't think about that. God doesn't see that part of my life. That's not part of my spiritual growth. But this is where God is showing us that your sexuality and what you do with it impacts every part of your life. It impacts your spiritual life. It impacts your emotional life. It impacts your mental life. It impacts your physical life. And to the very depths of the core of who you are. And that's where God said to me, yes, you need forgiveness, but I've already forgiven you, and now you need healing. Well, what do we need healing from? When we walk men and women through healing, we look at these four components. Number one, healing the wounds that we've accumulated because of our past. When we have, you know one that's been robbed from us and as an abuse or trauma or we've given that away, we suffer wounds. We suffer pain from that, emotional pain. And God wants us to bring that pain up and out so that he, he can heal that. Secondly, we need to grieve losses. You know, we don't like to grieve losses in our culture because we kind of look at it as a sign of weakness. But there's been things that we've lost because of our sexual past or things that have happened to us that God wants us to grieve. I had to grieve the fact that I didn't want to have sex before marriage. I had to grieve the fact that I didn't want to be, you know, married and divorced. I didn't want to have an abortion. I had to grieve all of those things and allow God to heal that. Third, we need to replace the lies that we ingrain because of our past. You know, the enemy comes in at us with so many lies, and God wants to take the lies and show us where they're a lie and replace it with his truth. And then lastly, breaking the bonds and allowing God to break these bonds that we've created in our past, break that one flesh bond so that we don't bring those into our present or future marriage and be able to have the kind of bond that he wants us to have in marriage. So I just want to share with you just a, for just a minute just some of the steps that God took me through on my own healing journey. And first of all, it started with surrendering my past to him. And even though I didn't want to and I didn't really want to look at all my past God said, will you let me have your past? I want to heal it, and then I want to use it to bring hope to other people. And I remember just letting him have it and just go, okay, God, show me about my past. Show me what's happened that you want to heal. And then the next step was just obeying the next thing he asked me to do. And the next thing he asked me to do, the scariest part, was tell my secret. Bring my secret that I'd been keeping for 25 years into the open. The first person he wanted me to tell was my mom, and I'm not sure why my mom, but... Thankfully, she lived far away at the time. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I didn't think it was great conversation on the phone. Hey, Mom, how's the weather? By the way, I've had an abortion. You know, I thought it would be nicer of me to write her a letter. And, of course, I was also a chicken, so I thought this is a, this is a win-win. And it took about a week to get there, and by then I had a little bit more courage as she called me and we talked it over. And, and how she responded gave me a great deal of hope that the enemy had been lying to me that people wouldn't accept me. Instead, God was going to reconcile all my relationships as I brought my secrets out into the open. And then, as I shared, he led me through different steps that he led just step by step of taking me through healing. You know, whether you've had an abortion or you've had abuse in your past, you're struggling with addictions, you've had trauma, or whatever uh, choices you've made, they can all affect intimacy with God and intimacy with others, and we bring them into our marriage. One of the other things that that we do that was so instrumental was writing a sexual history list and asking God to show me everyone I had created one of these one flesh bonds with and then praying a prayer and asking God to break those bonds. And there were some other, other things that we do in that process too that God uses strategic steps and tools that God used to completely heal me and set me free. There's a quote by a woman, her name is Harriet Tubman, and she says, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. I remember looking at that quote and I thought, how could that be? How could someone not know they were a slave and want to have freedom? And then I thought about the Israelites. I'm reading through the Old Testament and, you know, and and Moses took them out of the, God set them free from the Egyptians and, and within a few days they wanted to go back 
They wanted to go back to their, to their bondage and being a slave again. Isn't that amazing? What, what is the matter with us human people? And then I thought about myself, and here I was. God had already set me free, and yet I still continued to live as a slave in bondage to my shame and my pain rather than walking in the freedom that God had given me. Leviticus 26.13 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be a slave. I broke the bars to your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. And as I looked at that verse, I realized God breaks our yokes, but we have to take the yoke off. We have to take it off. Without healing, we can still walk around yoked to the wounds and the shames of our, shame of our past, keeping us from living and walking in freedom. From being able to experience the forgiveness God has freely offered and to be able to forgive ourselves and others. I remember the moment God showed me that I was still yoked. I was still chained up to my, my past. I still identified myself with my past. It was like I couldn't separate myself from my past. That was who I was rather than what I'd done. It was who I was. It was how I identified myself. And yet God didn't identify me as that. I had started sharing my story and God, at the time I was working at this pregnancy center, and one of the ministries that we had was a post-abortion Bible study for healing. And the woman who run that, I kept running into that woman. I tried to avoid her like the plague, but no, I kept running into her and somehow... I had told her I'd had an abortion and then she wouldn't leave me alone. She kept saying, you need to go through healing for that. And I'm going, I know, I know. But I kept saying, you know, I feel fine. I feel totally fine. I don't think I really need that. Well, not two days after I'd said those words, I was sitting at our a coffee talk that we had for our women Saturday morning. The first one I'd ever gone to. And at the end, a woman came up and shared about her, her testimony and her testimony was about abortion. And I, I looked around and I thought, I'm... Am I in a different planet? Like, what, this has never happened to me in Canada. I'm sitting in California, and people are, are sharing about their, their abortion in church. I'm looking around thinking, well, no lightning has struck, so I guess maybe we're okay. Then at the end, she asks us all to bow our heads and close our eyes, and then she has the audacity to say, now, if you've had an abortion, I'd like you to raise your hand. I'd like, you to, I'd like to pray for you. And I thought, is this woman nuts? Who is going to raise their hand? I know that you all peak, right? Don't you? Yes. So there was no way I was going to raise my hand. I wanted to. I wanted to. But I remember it was like my hand was encased in cement and I was wanting to lift it. And in that moment, you know, God, he says some funny things to me sometimes. (laughs) And he said to me, Well, Barb, if you're so fine, why can't you even raise your hand? And that was the moment I knew. God had broken the bar to my yoke, but I was still carrying it around. I was still letting the enemy define who I was and not God. And God wanted to heal me so that I could be free from that. We want to give you an opportunity today because I don't know what God has been speaking to you in in your life. I want to give you an opportunity to respond if this is something God is bringing to mind for you that he's been maybe even nudging you about, letting you know, showing you that you are still struggling with things. You, you have been forgiven, given, but for some reason you still feel stuck in this area or you've been trying to get back to God and you still feel like there's this block. What is it? You know what? God knows. You might not know, but God does. We're going to give you an opportunity to come forward for prayer, and I just want to pray for you as Pastor Jay comes forward as we um, just let the Holy Spirit move. We want you to know that Solid Rock Church is a safe place. The church should be a safe place, shouldn't it be? This should be where there is no judgment or condemnation because that's the whole message of the gospel. You don't have to clean up to come to God. He loves us in our mess. He loves us best when we bring him all our mess and we come to him with our mess. And, you know, it's okay. It takes a lot of courage, I know. 25 years of hiding, I know how hard that is. But God is going to start with you by bringing the secrets into the open. And let me just, let me just pray as we let the Holy Spirit move in, in your life and as God shows you what, he, what your next step is in surrendering this to him. Father, we just thank you for this morning. 
God, thank you for the opportunity to be here with these amazing people. God, your precious people whom you love and who you want to set free, God, to be unleashed into the world, into their communities and their families, Lord, to break generational cycles of sin, to set free, to heal, to make whole again where the enemy has destroyed. And God, I pray for them. I pray, God, that you would move among them right now. God, that you would just silence the enemy's condemning voice that you would take away the fear, God, that you you promise that you do not give us a, a spirit of timidity, but one of boldness and power. And God, I just pray that you would give your people the boldness and the power to stand up, God, and allow you to heal them, God, so that you can make this church, and you already are, but to continue to make this church a beacon of light and hope for this community, a safe place for the world to come and find healing and hope. God, thank you that you are a God of grace and redemption, that you love us so much. You don't care so much about what's happened in our past. You just care about what's going on now and in our future, and you just want to set us free to become all that you created us to be, to live out your purpose for us, your destiny for us, to make us a voice for those who don't have a voice, for those who are not yet free. God, give us a voice for them. Make us vehicles of your healing and grace to the world around us give you all the glory to